Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a very interesting list of violin concertos, but not just any violin concertos. These are all composers who only wrote two violin concertos. And the question we want to ask as we listen to these pairs of violin concertos is this. Are they fraternal twins or identical twins? In other words, do they show the composer writing in very different styles between the two works? Has, his, has their style changed or grown or evolved in the time between the two? Or is it still basically the same person? Can you tell it's the same person? And is it more similar than different? I, I think this is very interesting. And, you know, normally we take, you know, symphony cycles or things like that, and we try and talk about how a composer grows and evolves throughout his career. Some do, some don't. You know, it all depends. But in this particular case, you can take two works in the same genre and compare them. And that really makes the whole process a lot more convenient. And so uh, there are, oh, I don't know, how many of these things do I have? 15 pairs of violin concertos. And violin concertos, I just want to say in general, they're extremely difficult to write. Most composers only write one. And, uh, you know, the ones that are like the most famous romantic ones and those who write more than one um, are usually violinists. They write them for themselves. And so all that matters is the violin, violin part. The rest of it, which is like the form, the orchestration, all the rest is kind of, you know, it's there to show off the violin. And that's what it usually does rather effectively. But no, this is quite different. These are composers who just wrote two. And they're a unique group. It's a rare group. And I think, I think uh, we'll have some fun with this. I really do. So I want to go down the list of composers. And I leave it to you to tell me if they are identical twins or fraternal twins. I mean, whether the style is hugely different from, from one to the other. We'll talk about that a little too, obviously. I'm not going to just like, you know drop the list and run away. I couldn't do that. So let's start with the ultimate two violin concerto person, Bach. Now, we all know that Bach really wrote many more than two violin concertos, but two have come down to us. And so, and they're called numbers one and two, you know, they're BWV, what, 1041 and 1042, I think, something like that. But they're in, they're in A minor and E major. And the A minor is more popular than the E major. But even here, I think you can hear some rather substantive differences between the writing and the two concerti, particularly in their first movements, because the A minor is a rather brief three and a few minutes, and the E major is a rather lengthy seven and some minutes. It's twice as long. So there are going to be some serious formal differences, but there are also expressive differences too. And the, the Bach, the two Bach violin concertos are the first violin concertos that became you know, part and parcel of every sane violinist's repertoire. You know, before that, you know, Vivaldi, even the Four Seasons, so that came later, actually, in terms of, you know, 20th century violinists picking up, picking up, you know, different repertoire. But Bach's two violin concertos are incredibly famous and well known, possibly because of their rarity, and and they they are not the same, I don't think. I mean, they sound like Bach, obviously, as do all these pieces by all these people, but they are they are quite. I think they're fraternal twins, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Next, Wieniawski. Wieniawski, the great Polish violinist. Wieniawski violin concertos I find almost inexpressibly tedious unless they're played like, like gangbusters. Uh, you know, I, I think I've told this story before, but one of the, the most embarrassing moments of my life was when I saw the Wieniawski first or second violin concerto, I don't even remember which one, played by Midori um, with, with the Montreal Symphony under Charles Dutrois at Carnegie Hall. I went because they were doing, they were doing like Shostakovich eighth or something like that. And I was sitting up in the balcony with every single Suzuki violinist in New York. They were all there in the top balcony, and I was with a friend of mine, and I just passed out in the middle of the first movement. I fell asleep and started snoring rather loudly, and and I woke up eventually and saw all of these, these Suzuki violinists and their parents staring at me with 
evil intent in their eyes and my friend just sitting there laughing hysterically and I said to him, why didn't you wake me up? He said, because it kept me awake to watch them watch you. <laughs> and that was, that was my Vinyavsky experience. The truth is they're not bad pieces. Vinyavsky was one of those composers whose, whose, whose aesthetic was based on the Italian bel canto tradition, which is not a bad you know, school to base your aesthetic on, but he was a violin virtuoso, and his concerti have no reason to exist other than to show off the violin. They have good tunes, but you know, formally and, and texturally, and you know, they're, they're work a day. They're work a day, and, and you know, they're best appreciated, I think, by violinists. That's how I feel about them, and you can tell me if they're different. If these two violin concertos actually have really distinctive qualities that show some sort of growth or evolution in the style of the person who wrote them. I suggest not, but you can correct me. So after Vinyovsky, Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn, is, as you know, it's not really generally known that Mendelssohn's violin concerto, the famous one, um, is his second. It's really kind of his third because he actually wrote a double concerto for violin and piano as well. But there was an earlier concerto in D minor for violin and strings, which is quite beautiful. It's an absolutely lovely work, and it's gotten a bit of play um, in recent in recent centuries. Yehudi Menuhin championed it. And boy, can you hear a difference. This is fascinating from the Mendelssohn, the kid, because he was like, I don't know, seven or something when he wrote it. And then his mature violin concerto, which he worked on and worked on and worked on for years, and which was written for his concertmaster in Leipzig. That really is a magnificent work. I mean, it's, of course, one of the all-time classic violin concertos ever. But even in the earlier work, you can hear that there is someone who really knows what they're doing writing for the violin, and uh, they're two wonderful works to compare. They make, uh, that's a good reason to listen to the earlier one if you haven't already. When I was writing my book on Mendelssohn, you know, I had to listen to all these early concertos, the two double piano concertos and the other things that he wrote for his you know, domestic circle, and I was amazed at just how good they are. I really was. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting much, but he was, he was quite something. So after Mendelssohn, Prokofiev. Now, the two Prokofiev concertos are, are quite different stylistically, I think. You know, the first is from his earlier, more sort of modernist period. Um, it's more formally interesting. And the second is from that wrong note romantic after he went back to the Soviet Union period. Um, it has the more popular tunes and it has a, a, a more traditional kind of shape. But the thing that's so interesting to me about the two Prokofiev violin concertos is that, is that he wrote them at all because he was a pianist. And, and, you know, and he wrote five piano concertos. I mean, for him to write violin concertos was really kind of extraordinary. I mean, the reason he did it was because he had fabulous violin soloists who were willing to play them. I mean, that's the reason to do it. And I have to say, in this connection, you know, violinists are a lot nastier than pianists are. Pianists basically will play anything once. They'll give it a shot. They may like it. You know, they, as long as it's, you know, decent keyboard writing, they're usually cool with it. You know, pianists are, are, are more mellow. Violinists are not mellow. Violinists are, are really kind of tyrants. You remember what happened with Dvorak's violin concerto, how he had to write it and rewrite it, and Joachim wouldn't play it, and everyone corrected him, and everyone told him. And, and this was a guy who was a violinist. I mean, he was a violist and a violinist. He knew, I mean, he knew how to write for the violin. But, but virtuoso violinists particularly, especially in the 19th century, they had their own proprietary styles and their own proprietary technique, their own fingerings, their own way of handling the, the instrument. And they were not shy in telling composers what to do in order for them to, to deign to, to <laughs> you know, look upon their, their lowly efforts on their behalf. It really, it really was a project to get a violin concerto played by a great violinist who was also a composer for his own, own uses. And so, 
And so Prokofiev, in the 20th century, that changed. In the 20th century, you had the, these great violinists, you had a great Russian school of violin playing, as we all know who all those wonderful Russian violinists were. And so Russian composers had the opportunity to write violin concertos secure in the knowledge that they could work with the soloist directly, that they would then be performed. And that's why we have two violin concertos by somebody like Prokofiev, who was such a, a, a piano-based composer. In everything that he did, he composed at the piano. He is piano, every, his music is pianistic. But there are these two first-class violin concertos. And it may be because they're not piano works that he, he puts some extra effort into them. I don't know, but it's, a, it's an interesting question. So there are the two Prokofievs, and I think you can very clearly see that they are fraternal twins. They are not identical twins. Then we've got Bartok. This is a tougher one. Because Bartok disassembled his first piano concerto. This is a story that actually um, is not rare because, like I said, composers couldn't write violin concertos unless they had violinists who were around to do them, and Bartok was another pianist. The second violin concerto was extremely popular and successful, but the first, it wasn't. It's in two movements. It was written for a violinist he was sort of in love with, named Steffi Geyer, I think was her name, and he took the first movement and, and made it part of his two portraits, the ideal first portrait, and the the second movement he just sort of forgot about and got rid of it, and, and that was it. And it was only after his death that the piece was reassembled and performed it all. So the first violin concerto was early Bartok, before he had done a lot of his folk song explorations and evolved his mature style, but the second is fully mature Bartok, and they are, they are quite different, and the first is vastly less popular than the second, and for reasons that I think are pretty obvious when you hear it. I mean, it's a, it is formally unusual, and the first movement is a big, long, slow movement that sounds a lot like, like a lot of chromatic sort of sludge. I mean, the two, the two portraits aren't too popular either. They're one ideal and one grotesque. The grotesque movement is two and a half minutes that he, he wrote to complement the first one that was different from the second movement of the violin concerto, and it's a whole story. So those are, those are interesting to pair, though, in order to understand Bartok's evolution as an artist in two handy-dandy works. I mean, they're useful, at least for that purpose, and a lot of people I've heard, you know, like the first concerto. I know people who really like it, so I'm not going to, you know, diss it too badly. So after Bartok, Joachim Raff. Yeah, good old Raff. He wrote a couple of violin concertos, and they're lovely violin concertos. I think, I think Raff's concertos are often better than his symphonies, because he 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 disciplined himself more in writing them. They're shorter, they're shorter, and they're they're beautifully tuneful. I mean, Raff had a real melodic gift. He really did. And he, there's also a, a, a short little work like a Canzonetta or can something, something short. <laughs> I forget what it's called. I've got the disc right over there. But it's gorgeous. I mean, he wrote beautiful tunes. And so the two violin concertos are quite, quite lovely. And it's an interesting question whether Raff had any evolution at all stylistically. Because, because, you know, we know that those, you know, his 12 symphonies or so and a lot of other stuff. He wrote tons and tons and tons of music. And a lot of it is, is, is really beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. But it, it, you'd be hard-pressed to put something on Drop the Needle and say, Aha! That must be Raff and nobody else. I mean, that's the problem with Raff. Uh, you know, whether or not the music has that that personal quality that's immediately identifiable. But they are lovely works, and they have been recorded quite well, and I recommend them highly. And you tell me what you think um, the differences are between them, if you should chance to listen to them. After Raff, of course, Shostakovich. Shostakovich's two violin concertos, I think, are, well, the first is incredibly popular and famous, and the second is as good as unknown. And the second, I mean, you can listen to it. It's, it's not a, a bad work by any stretch of the imagination. It really isn't. It's, it's quite fine. It sounds a lot like Shostakovich. I think in this case, we may be dealing with the situation where we have a pair of somewhat fraternal twins 
um, in the sense that I mean, or, excuse me, identical twins, not fraternal, identical twins, in the sense that, in the sense that the second violin concerto impresses people as a kind of been there, heard that experience. Although it's quite different formally, the scoring is different, but it doesn't have um, much new to say. Let's put it that way. I mean, to that extent, it's maybe you might consider it different, but I. I'm a little, I'm a little, you know, on the fence with this one. I'm a really a little, little, little tormented about how to deal with the two Shostakovich violin concertos. It's not like the cello concertos, where, where the second is a magnificent piece that's neglected because the first is so popular, but there's nothing about the second that's that's uh, you know inferior to the first, and I think it's quite a different work. Whereas the second violin concerto, I'm not sure it has those qualities. And so I'm curious to know what you think about it. I think this is an interesting pairing. Um, certainly uh, taken in isolation, it's, it's a fine work. It really is. And you can, you can, you know, decide for yourself. So after Shostakovich, here's a guy who you might not realize wrote two violin concertos, Philip Glass. Yes, he did. And Philip Glass, you know, I, I, I've seen the comments. You, some of you guys are so harsh when it comes to Philip Glass. I mean, I know it's because you, a lot of you despise minimalism and that aesthetic, and I get it. That's okay. But Glass has a very wide stylistic range. And not everything he does sounds, you know, like early glass or like Satyagraha or Einstein on the beach or whatever it is. I mean, you know, he, he, he really has evolved, I think, as an artist. And I think we hear that in his two violin concertos. But, but again, I am not going to make a big issue of it. I would much rather you tell me what you think. But of course, then you'd have to listen to them, wouldn't you? <laughs> yes, you do. You absolutely do. And I, I, the result, I think, is kind of interesting. Uh, we'll see what you have to say about it. After Philip Glass, oh, here's a really interesting guy, Nikolai Roslovets. Now, Roslovets is a really interesting composer. He was a Russian futurist who was totally reviled and banned and, 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 and dissed and, you know, because he didn't, he didn't defuturize himself. Um, unlike some other composers from that period, um, when the party went after him, he, he withdrew sort of, kind of, and went to, you know, he was sent down to like, I don't know, somewhere in like Armenia or somewhere in the, in the hinterlands, um, whence he stayed until he died. And that was it. And he didn't write a lot of music. And what he did write, much of it wasn't published. Um, because it was in, it was in disgrace for his entire career, and it wasn't until the 80s and 90s that some of this stuff, you know, popped up again. And he wrote two violin concertos. He was known for a while as the Russian Schoenberg, because some of his music is atonal, but somehow it sounds Russian. I I'm not, you know, I, I I'm not entirely his his brand of atonality was his. Let's put it that way. It was as he began life as kind of a scriabin like futurist, and then. After that, I mean, and he had his flirtations with certain folk musics from where he was, wherever he was, but they're very, very interesting works, and they've been recorded quite well um, by, who is it, I, I think Alina Abragamova, someone like that, on Hyperion. Um, I have that disc sitting over there, too. They're really interesting, and it, it, it's fascinating that he wrote them at all because the chances of him getting performed were minimal. But once again, for some reason, Russian composers seem to be able to churn out more than one violin concerto. And Roslovets did it, and the music deserves to be heard. It's challenging. Challenging, but I think quite rewarding and very, very, very special. So there's a guy whose name, you know, may be new to you. And he's somebody you can explore. Mark andre Hamelin did a gorgeous disc of his piano works, which you might also want to consider on Hyperion. So after Roslovets... Penderecki! Penderecki, you know, his enormous first violin concerto he wrote for Isaac Stern, and then, and then he wrote a second one for Anna Sophie Mutter. I think it was for her, but it's called like Metamorphoses. It's, they're very different works. Very, very different works. And Penderecki, of course, is a composer whose style evolved 
enormously over the course of his career. It went from, from avant-garde, you know, extreme extraordinariness to his own brand of return to tonality, romantic expressivity. And the two violin concertos both come from that late period. You know, the, the earlier one is not avant-garde crazy stuff, but, but they're, they're very different works all the same. Um, and so, you know, give them a shot. Tell me what you think. And after Penderecki, these are in no order, as I, I, I gather you can tell. Uh, there is Dohnani, Erno Dohnani. For some reason, and this is another interesting little fact, for some reason, everybody is willing to grant him his, his props as a composer for the piano. His piano concerti, the two of them, are, are better known, let's put it that way. But he also wrote two violin concerti. And they're in that wonderful Hungarian romantic tradition. They're beautiful works. He was a real craftsman. Um, he never became a modernist like Bartok or any of those people. He basically stayed within his late romantic Brahmsian with Hungarian tinged elements. Fach, that was his, that was his style. But these two violin concertos really ought to be played. They ought to be heard. They're lovely. They're absolutely lovely. And it's, it's, it's ridiculous that no one plays them. And, uh, you know, I, I think he was a composer whose style was his style. I don't detect a lot of change as his career went on. He, he found what he liked and he wrote what he liked and that's what he liked. But that doesn't mean, of course, that the pieces are, you know, cookie cutter. They are identical twins in the aesthetic, in the style, but they are not identical twins in terms of, you know, same old, same old. They're good works and they deserve to be heard. So, let's see what we have after Dachnani. Uh -huh. Right there. John Williams, as in Star Wars John Williams. Yes, he wrote two violin concertos. One was recorded, <clears throat> excuse me, one was recorded by Gil Shaham for Deutsche Gramophone, and the second one was written for Anna Sophie Mutter, who's quite busy. She has a tremendous amount of music to her credit. And she recorded the second one, and actually it was released rather recently. Now, John Williams' situation is, I think, very, very interesting. It, it, to be compared not with himself, but with other film composers who wrote concert music, for example, Korngold. If you listen to Korngold's concert music, there is no difference in aesthetic between that and his film music. And Korngold was very clear about that. He was already a successful composer of operas and concert music before he started writing film scores. And when he was hired to write film scores, his deal was, I can do what I want, and I'm writing the way I want, and this is my style. And they wanted his style in the movies. <clears throat> John Williams, uh, you know, by the time he showed up, the entire substratum of the musical universe had changed. He was writing film music and he wrote concert music, and his style in his concert music is quite different from that in his film music. It's spikier, it's more dissonant, it's more challenging, and, and the criteria for what made you a serious composer of concert music were so different from what made you a successful co composer of film music. And I think that's kind of a shame, really. Um, I, I really do, because as a composer of film music, Williams has to be a chameleon. He has to write in any number of styles, and his, his gift is being able to adapt himself, as with all film composers, to whatever, to whatever the circumstances are um, in which he's working. Um, uh, his concert music is an entirely different beast. And so I just think it's very, very interesting to, to sort of meditate on the circumstances that would allow a film music composer to be taken seriously as a composer of concert music, whether this really represents a different facet of him or is he bowing to what today is the pressure to write effective concert music by not sounding like a film music composer. Whereas Korngold suffered because that's what he did. I mean, the story, you know, people derided Korngold because they said, well, his music sounds like his movie music, but it was really the other way around. His movie music sounded like his earlier music. 
Uh, it's an interesting, interesting question and taste, musical aesthetics, and you know our culture and how we treat these things. But the two violin concertos of John Williams are interesting both for their their macroscopic position in the musical world and their microscopic position within his own oeuvre. So give him a listen and let me know what you think. And after John Williams, oh, this one's great, Walter Piston. You know, nobody gives Walter Piston any love, and he was such a good composer. He was a wonderful craftsman, a beautiful composer of, of exquisitely put together fine, fine music. Was he Mahlerian? No. Was he Wagnerian? No. He was a neoclassic, a neoclassical composer. He was into abstract forms. He wrote virtually no programmatic music at all, very, very little. And the the and he wrote two violin concertos, and they're wonderful works. There's also like a fantasy for violin and orchestra. There are three violin works. They're all on Naxos. The first violin concerto by Wright should be as popular as any 20th century piece for the for the for the instrument. It's a tremendously fabulous work. But Piston was also a composer who evolved, and as he evolved, his idiom became more challenging, a little bit spikier, a little more dissonant. And the second violin concerto, for that reason, will never be as popular as the first. It's a bit more challenging. They are fraternal twins, not identical twins. But even that counts against him. That's what's so annoying about these 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 the way we pigeonhole these people, you know, because Piston wrote and evolved throughout his career and, and turned in a very, very respectable and beautiful body of work. And I think the violin concertos make a fabulous entree into his style and spirit because they're both quite approachable. I mean, the second is uh, it's marginally maybe a little bit a little bit tougher than the first, but, y you know, they're still really, really good pieces and you can enjoy them equally, I think. And uh, you should hear them. You really should hear them. They are a find. That's one of those things you're going to listen to and you're going to, ooh, yeah, good stuff, right? And after Piston, Martineau. Now, Martineau wrote tons of concerto-like objects that include solo violins. So, so there are these other works for chamber orchestra, the concerto grosso, neo-baroque sort of things. But there are two numbered violin concerti. And the first was lost for most of his life. I mean, he well, actually was lost after he died. Nobody knew what happened to it. But it, was, it popped up, as these things have a tendency to do. And Josef Suk recorded it. And now a bunch of people have recorded it. And it's an early work, or earlier work, from his Paris period, when he was heavily into neoclassicism and that sort of Baroque motoric rhythm stuff. And it's in that style. And the second violin concerto is one of the glories of his American period. It was from the same time as the symphonies. And so it's a bigger, bolder, more romantic, expansive piece of music. It's one of the great 20th century violin concerti. And, and here we are clearly dealing with fraternal twins because his style evolved considerably from the time in which he was in the, in the Paris of the 1920s to his period in the, in the U.S. and later Europe in the 1940s and 50s. So you should definitely check out the two Martin New Concertos. This is a wonderful example of fraternal twins and stylistic evolution from a composer who wrote tons of music. And for that re reason, he can be sort of hard to, to, to get your, your brain around and who is often derided for being excessively prolific. And you can hear it. No, 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 no. He had, he had his path. And you hear it very clearly in these two works. However, however, I have to end with two of the glories of 20th century violin concerto writing, and they are Shimanovsky. Boy, are these two wonderful fraternal twins. Very, very different. Shimanovsky isn't a composer who's on many people's radar, so we don't really think about his stylistic evolution, but it was huge. He started out as a Scriabin-esque, highly chromatic, yummy, exotic, you know, Oriental, Asian-influenced, you know, that kind of stuff. And the first violin concerto is just that. It's a giant, orgasmic, you know, voluptuous tone poem where the violin's like in its highest position the whole time and it's, it's oh it's gorgeous absolutely gorgeous by the time we get to the second violin concerto he had been absolutely transfixed by his native foolish 
po Polish, Polish. His native Polish folk music. His native Polish folk music. Yes, you know what I mean? His native Polish folk music. And the second violin concerto couldn't be more different. It's like, it's like, it's a very similar evolution, actually, to what we hear in Albert Roussel, from his, like, impressionist early works to his neoclassical, rugged, rhythmic, supercharged later works. And that's what you hear in the two Szymanowski violin concertos. They are both masterpieces. Number one gets far more attention than number two, which I think is totally unfair because number two is absolutely a masterpiece in its own right. They are fabulously well written for the violin, glorious pieces. Really, the, the two great Polish violin concertos and two of the great 20th century works in the medium, as I suggested. And that is where we end this discussion of fraternal versus identical twins, composers and their stylistic evolution, our, the aesthetics of, oh, I mean, you know, there's so much stuff we can talk about in considering this list. I think it really has some potential there to, to get you thinking, and I hope listening too. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.